Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, double CCIA and creator of the CCNA Route Switch version 3 complete video course. And one of the topics on the version 3 exam is IP version 4 static routing. We're going to take a look at four different ways of doing that, that static routing in this video. Stay tuned. Let's think about how a router gets routing information in its IP routing table. And specifically in this video, we're going to be considering IP version 4 static routes. There are some different ways that an IP version 4 router can get that routing information into the IP routing table. If a router is connected to a network, if I'm directly connected to 10.0.0.0 slash 24, then I know that I know how to get to it. I'm connected to it. So a connected route, that's one way that a route can get into a router's IP routing table. We might have dynamically learned routes. We might be using a routing protocol such as RIP or OSPF or EIGRP or BGP. That's another way that we can have routes injected into the IP routing table. And sometimes, and this is a CCNP routing and switching topic, not something we'll cover at the CCNA level, but we could have redistributed routes. Let's say that a router is running both EIGRP and OSPF. Well, maybe I learn a route from an EIGRP speaking neighbor, and then I could do what is called a redistribution into OSPF. I could take that EIGRP learned route and then advertise it to my OSPF neighbors. That's a redistributed route. But the focus of this video is on static routes. These are routes that we as an administrator can go in and add to the router. And we've got a few different types of static routes that we can add. And we're going to demonstrate each of these four different types in this video. The first type of static route we want to think about is a static network route. This is where we go into a router and say, here's how to get to a specific network. And the way we get to a specific network might be to send a packet to a specified next hop IP address, the IP address of the next hop router. Or we could give the egress interface, in other words, the exit interface on this router. If you want to get to 10.0.0.0/24, go out of this interface. Another type of route that we could add is a static host route. Now this is very similar to a static network route, but instead of specifying a network, we're specifying a host. In other words, we're specifying an IP address with a 32-bit subnet mask. If I say here's IP address 10.1.2.3 and it's got a 32-bit subnet mask, well, I'm specifying a host in that case. Something else that's really powerful is a static default route. Maybe this router at a branch office somewhere only has one way to get out to the internet. It only has one way to get out to the rest of the company, out to the rest of the world, and that's to go back to the headquarters router. Well, instead of running some sort of a dynamic routing protocol where it has to learn about all those routes out there, if it's only got one way to get back to everybody else, we could just enter a static default route, sometimes called a gateway of last resort. We can say, if this network address is not local, then go here, go back to the headquarters. That's a static default route. We're also going to see something called a floating static route. A floating static route is a static route that might not be in effect right now. It sort of kicks in when we need it. You see, maybe we prefer a path via router A, but if router A is no longer available, we would like another route to kick in and maybe route us via router B. Well, what I could do is add a static route that looks less attractive than, let's say, a dynamically learned route. A dynamically learned route is going to have something called an administrative distance that depends on the routing protocol. RIP, for example, that we're going to be discussing has an administrative distance of a 120, and anything below that is more believable. A directly connected route, that has an administrative distance of a zero. A static route, by default, has an administrative distance of a one, but I could go in and say that here's a static route with an administrative distance of 130, something higher than the 120. That's going to make it less attractive than the RIP learned route. So we'll be using the RIP learned route most of the time, but if it ever goes away for some reason, no problem. We can just have our floating static route kick in because it's now the most believable route. Now let's go out to a live topology and configure each of these different types of static routes beginning with a static network route. We're sitting here on router R1 in this topology, and we want to see what routes we know about right now. Let's do a show IP route. And we can see that I know about, for example, the 10.0.0.0 slash 30 route. And the reason I know about that is I'm directly connected. You see this C right there? 
That tells me that I've learned this because I'm directly connected. You also see some L's here. The L is a local interface. This is the IP address of a local interface. For example, 10.0.0.1 slash 32, a 32-bit subnet mask is specifying a single IP address, and it says we're directly connected to serial 1 slash 0. That is the IP address, as you can see in this topology, that is the IP address of serial 1 slash 0. But right now, all we know about are networks or addresses physically connected to us. Let's now educate R1 about how to get to the networks connected to R2 and connected to R3, and we're going to do that by creating a couple of static routes. Let's go into global configuration mode, and I'm going to say IP route, and if I want to get to that network off of R2, the Ethernet network, that's 198.51.100.0. It's got a 24-bit subnet mask. And I'm going to say to get there, I'm going to go out of the interface serial 1 slash 0. That's my egress. That's my exit interface. That's one way we could configure a static route. Let's add another static route to get to the network off of R3, the 203.0.113.0 slash 24 network. I'll say IP route. And let's say 203.0.113.0. Again, we've got a 24-bit subnet mask. But this time, instead of saying go out of this interface, I'm going to say let's go to this next top IP address. We can configure this either way. I'll say let's go to 10.0.0.6. That's my next top IP address. That's another way that we could add a static route. Now, let's test to make sure this works. Can I ping that interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0 on R2? Let's try to do a ping to 198.51.100.1. Success. Excellent. Can I ping the fast ethernet 0 slash 1 interface on R3? Let's do a ping to 203.0.113.1. Success again. Excellent. We've now trained our router how to get to these networks by giving static routes. By the way, here's a real world tip for you. Just a word of caution. Notice how... I specified an egress interface in this static route. That's okay because this was a serial interface. This was a point-to-point -point interface. However, we could run into some issues if I tried to do that with a fast ethernet or any kind of an ethernet interface as my egress interface. If I had done it here, if I had said fast ethernet 0 slash 1, go out of that interface to get to this destination network, that could cause an issue. And the reason is, since an Ethernet interface is not a point-to-point -point link, the router is really not sure where it should send the frame. Specifically, it doesn't know the destination MAC address, the destination layer 2 address. So how does it get that destination layer 2 address? It ARPs for it. It sends out an ARP broadcast. In fact, it's going to ARP for all of the addresses that it tries to reach in that remote subnet. And if we had lots of devices in that destination network, this could cause an excessive amount of ARP traffic on the network. So it's a best practice to specify a next top IP address if our egress interface is some sort of an Ethernet interface. Now, let's once again examine our IP routing table. Let's do a show IP route. And now we can see in addition to the connected and local routes that we saw earlier, I now have a couple of statically configured routes. Oh, and here's just sort of an oddity I want you to know about. Notice that for this static route, to get to this network, when I specified we're going to use an egress interface of serial 1 slash 0, when you specify an egress interface as the way to get to this destination network, for some reason, don't try to read too much meaning into this, I just want you to know about this little oddity with Cisco IOS, for some reason it says that network is connected. It's not really connected, but it's going to show up that way, and I don't want you to be thrown by that. So this has been a look at how we configure a static network route now I'm going to change out our topology and we'll take a look at configuring a static host route. Here in this topology, we've got a server, server1. It has an IP address of 203.0.113.100. And let's say for some design reason that when we're sending traffic from R1 to server1, we prefer that the traffic go via R2. But other traffic going to the 203.0.113.0 slash 24 network, other traffic, we would prefer that it go via router R3. To set this up, we could create a couple of static routes, one to get to the network and one to get to server 1. That static route to get to just one IP address, server 1 in this case, that's called a static host route. Let's see how to set this up. First, I'll set up the static route like we did a few moments ago to get to an entire network. I'll say IP route. And if I want to get to the 203.0.113.0 network, 
with a 24-bit subnet mask, I want to go to an XTOP IP address of 10.0.0.6. That's R3. Now let's specify our static host route. I'll say IP route, and I want to go to 203.0.113.100, and that's going to have a 32-bit subnet mask. Because when we specify a 32-bit subnet mask, we're specifying a single IP address. In this case, the IP address of server 1. If I want to go to server 1 from R1, I want to go via router R2 at an IP address of 10.0.0.2. Let's check out the IP routing table. Let's do a show IP route. We see I've got those two static routes, one for the host, one for the network. And let's make sure that we're really following the paths that we specified. I want to do a trace route to the fast ethernet zero slash one interface on R3. That should go via R3. Let's do a trace route to 203.0.113.2. And we can see that the next hop IP address is 10.0.0.6 R3, fantastic. Now let's do a trace route to 203.0.113. .100. And by the way, I'll tell you, I really don't have that server in the topology. This trace route is going to fail. But I'm doing the trace route just so that we can see the next top IP address. What does the routing logic say? The routing logic says go where? And hopefully, and yes it does, and I'll break out of this. The routing logic says we're going to go to 10.0.0.2. That's router R2. We've now seen how to specify a static route that gets us to a single IP address. And by the way, with these static routes, if the next top IP address suddenly becomes unavailable or an interface or egress interface that we specify goes down, then by default, those static routes are going to be removed from the IP routing table. If for some reason, though, we want the route to remain, sometimes you can have mechanisms that check to see if a route is in the routing table. Maybe you want it to appear even though you're not really able to get there. So if you want a route to remain in the IP routing table, even if the specified next top IP address is not available or the egress interface is down, here's how you could do that. There would be rare occasions where we might want to do this, but what we could do is give the keyword of permanent. We could put permanent on the end of this, and that would make this route stay in the IP routing table, even if, in this case, 10.0.0.2 were no longer available to us. But again, this is something that we would rarely do. Now, let's take a look at a different topology. And in that topology, we're going to configure a static default route. In this topology, we're going to be configuring a router BR1. That's going to be a branch office that connects back to the HQ, back to the headquarters router. And uh, it's through the headquarters site that we get out to the internet and we get to the rest of the company. The point is, BR1 has only one point to get out to everybody else in the world. If a network is not local, it's got to go to HQ to get there. So instead of configuring lots of static routes for lots of different networks within our company, or instead of trying to learn the full BGP internet routing tables, which would be thousands and thousands of routes, instead of learning all that route information, we could really simplify it in this case. We've only got one way to get out to the rest of the world. What we can do is specify a static default route. It's much like a PC booting up on the network and getting IP address information via DHCP. Not only does that PC get an IP address, it gets a subnet mask, a default gateway, a DNS server, but that default gateway tells the PC how to get out to the rest of the world. That's essentially what we can do here to BR1. Very easy to set up. We're going to go into global configuration mode and we're going to say IP route. And here's the way we specify a static default route. It's all zeros for the network address and for the subnet mask. It's going to be 0.0.0.0, .0 space 0, .0, .0, .0. And we're going to say to get to the rest of the world, we're going to go out of serial 1 slash 0. We'll enter that. Let's check it out in the IP routing table. Let's do a show IP route. And we see S saying it's a statically configured route. But we also see this star, this asterisk. What that means is that this is a candidate default route. Not only is it a statically configured route, it's a route to the rest of the world as we see here. Now let's see if it really works. Can I ping? This IP address that we say is out on the internet, 203.0.113.1. We certainly don't have an entry in our IP routing table to get to that specific network, but we've got a static default route. And the ping is successful. Now I'm going to switch out the topology one more time, and we're going to take a look at the very powerful floating static route. The final type of static route that we want to talk about is a floating static route. And we say that it's floating because it's not in effect all the time. 
In this topology, I'm running RIP. We'll take a look later on in our studies at how to configure RIP, the routing information protocol. But R1, if I do a show IP route, R1 knows how to get to this 203.0.113.0 slash 24 network that we're saying is out on the internet. It knows how to get there because of RIP. That's what the R means. We've learned it from RIP. However, let's say that something happened to that link from R1 to R3. That link goes down. Then we want an alternate path to get to this network out on the internet. That's what we want to see how to do in this topology. Let's go ahead and add that static route. It's much like we did before, except we're going to specify a higher administrative distance. You see with this RIP entry, you see this 120? That's the distance. That's the administrative distance. And lower is better. So I'm going to add a floating static route. And what makes it floating is that its distance is going to be greater than 120. We'll make it 125. Here's how we do that. I'm going to say IP route 203.0.113.0. With a 24 bit subnet mask. I'm going to say to get there, go to a next top IP address of R2. Go to 10.0.0.2. And here's where we make it a floating static route. I'm going to specify the distance, the administrative distance of this static route. The default administrative distance of a static route is one. It's very believable. The only thing more believable is a directly connected route. However, I'm going to specify this has an administrative distance of 125, higher, less desirable than RIP's administrative distance of 120. Now, after I add that route, check this out. If I do a show IP route again, we don't see it. There's nothing in the IP routing table that says, here's a static route that's going to get us to this destination network. The reason it's not appearing in the IP routing table is that there is a better route. Just because a router knows about a route is not a guarantee that that route is going to make it into the router's IP routing table. The router is only going to put routes into the IP routing table that it considers best candidates to get to that destination network. And right now, the RIP learned route looks better because its distance is 120. It looks better than the static route. However, let's say that this link goes down. I'm going to go into interface serial 1 slash 1, and I'm going to do a shutdown command. We're simulating a link failure. All right, we've shut down the link between R1 and R3, but notice in the topology, the traffic is now flowing over the top link. How's that possible? Well, let's take a look at our IP routing table again. Let's do a show IP route. Now, because it's the best route that the router knows about, now we are using that floating static route. We're saying to get to this network, instead of going to R3, which we were doing via the RIP learned route, now we're saying, we're going to go to 10.0.0.2. That's router R2. And this video has given us a look at how to configure four different types of static routes for IP version 4 networks. In our next video, we'll see how to do the same thing for IP version 6 networks. If you want to learn even more about Cisco routing and switching technologies, just click the link in the description or on the right side of the screen, and I'll send you more training videos. And also, if you don't want to miss any of my YouTube videos, be sure and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.